Hello. Hello. What's up? What, okay, what are you doing right now? What are you doing right now? A puzzle? What are you yeah. doing? Okay, well, Five thousand pieces. It's it's not puzzle time. It's podcast. Time. Oh, is that right now? Okay, I'll get on right now. Bye. Okay. All right. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Oh good. yeah. What's going on? I'm ready. Jesse, I I just want to tell you something. We have an opportunity today with with Mr. Professor Dr. Principal Investigator Mark Puddle. You know, he's like he can give us some insights into like ecosystems cuz I have a real squirrel problem. I just want to say if my like internet goes out, I have a squirrel problem here. I'm being infiltrated with squirrels. I mean, geez, what, do you, what do you mean? Since when? Since always and all the we're doing all this work here. Did you did you see me go off and on today on our call? Do they They're, come at night or something? No, they come all during the day. And I was just letting the team know they, they've been chewing up my blanket. And then they, they leave. So this our neighbor feeds Do the they squirrel. get in the house? They don't, but they come right up into the little house. And then they look like they're going to kill Billy because they're definitely bigger than Billy. So I'm just saying. I mean, these might I, not be I, normal squirrels. Hey, Mark. Hello. We were, we, we, were, we were talking about invasive species. Priscilla has a squirrel problem. Do you know anything about that? Uh, right. So that's the eastern fox squirrel, the one with the bushy tail you see running up and down the trees. Are you going to be able to help me? This is like incredible. Welcome, yeah. Mark. You know, a lot of people use um, poison bait for them, right? And. The uh, bad thing about that is they wander off and die, and then coyotes and bobcats eat them, and they get poisoned as well. Uh, you end up with a lot of um, yeah. apotrophic level carnivores. Before we keep going, let's just quickly introduce Mark. How do we pronounce your last? Is it uh, Hoddle? Where so, are you from, Mark? I'm from New Zealand. Mm, beautiful there. It is. I'm going back there for six months at the end of October. What what part? I'll be based in Auckland, which is in the North Island. So, you know, what's going on in Christchurch with those well, earthquakes? Um, Did that all stop? Yeah, that's pretty much done and the city's still rebuilding. And I was living in Christchurch just before I moved to the States. And, Dur uh, what, what, during the earthquakes? No, I, was, I left well before all that happened, but I still have a lot of work colleagues there and I'm very fond of that city. So, yeah, it was quite sad. Where did you, I mean, because uh, New Zealand doesn't really have trouble with invasive species, does it? It's oh, yeah, it does. It it's, does? It's, wow. it's, it's pretty bad in a lot of ways, yeah. So some Is of the it, big problems are invasive mammals, which have decimated I, native bird population. Well, so how do we, well, first of all, how did you get to do what you do? What, how did, what made you want to study these systems? Yes, um, as a kid, I was always had a, I wouldn't say a love of insects, but like a fascination for them. And, you know, right back from when I was a kid, I always had a jar and I was collecting stuff to watch it. Not because I wanted to collect bugs because, you know, some people like collecting stuff because that's what they do. I'm not a collector like that. I, was a, I collected them and liked watching them and figuring out what they were doing to make a living. And a lot of this sort of centered around an interest in praying mantids. And I used to rear a native praying mantid. I loved feeding it flies, watching it stalk the prey in a jar, catch it. And when I was amazed, it laid an egg case. I had no idea that these things laid eggs like this. And those, that big Uthika, out of it hatched hundreds of little mantids, which I collected up. I put them on my mother's fuchsias, which had a really bad white fly problem. I didn't know what white flies were at the time. They were small enough for these baby mantids to eat. And I thought I'll put them on mum's fuchsias and if they eat them, maybe they'll clean up the these little flies that are all over her uh, plants. Well, that that really didn't work. <laughs> but um, that was Why? basically the intro. Well, the mantids are too generalist in what they want. They don't stay put. They walk around a lot and then they mm. start eating each other. <laughs> so, mm. so, so, so it really didn't work that well and then I went off to high school and we had to do a science project and something I'd been watching in the garden were um, ladybugs eating aphids so I set up an experiment where I had a plant that had aphids only then aphids and ladybugs and documented that ladybugs really do control aphids but what was most mind-blowing to me about that is I knew nothing about the life cycle of a ladybug and I watched them they laid eggs. I thought, oh, yeah, yeah, insects lay eggs. And I was expecting to hatch out of that egg would be a miniature ladybug. It didn't. 
it was a grub. I was looking at the gun. God, maybe these eggs weren't from ladybugs. But then I watched them. They started eating the aphids. Then they pupated it. And when they went into a pupil form, they started to look like ladybugs. And I watched them. They hatched and they were ladybugs. I was blown away. I thought, God, I've made a massive scientific discovery here. These things are like monarch caterpillars. They, they have a chrysalis. They have a pupil stage. So I went running off to the library to see if anybody had discovered this. And I was bitterly disappointed to be known for like many hundreds of years. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, so that big scientific on? discovery really Wait, wasn't yeah. there. <laughs> Mark, well, you got to start somewhere. Wait, I have a quick question for, for me that does not know anything about yeah. science and maybe the audience. What's pupil? Is that like, what is that word you use? So basically, you know, when you have a caterpillar and it spins up a cocoon or makes a chrysalis, it undergoes metamorphosis in that structure. And we call that process pupation, where you're basically transitioning from the larval or the immature form into the adult form. And that transition's dramatic, right? Because the butterfly looks nothing like the caterpillar. It's, it's an amazing reorganization of your bodily parts. So caterpillars are basically a sack that eats stuff. The butterfly is basically a sack that reproduces. So they have these, you know, vastly different um, life history characteristics. The immature stages eat. The adult stage, which looks dramatically different, it's just a bag of eggs and sperm flying around. But they get to have more. They get to have more life stuff than like human beings, right? They get to do these different forms. Yeah, saying? they do. And uh, that makes them vulnerable to a lot of different stuff. So when you're in the egg stage, you could be parasitized. While you're a caterpillar, you could be parasitized or eaten by something. When you're in the pupil stage, you could be parasitized, eaten or die from disease. So it's sort of like human beings. Yeah, um, I guess uh, there's a lot of population <laughs> density regulation that goes on. Yeah. You know, when you say invasive species, mm -hmm. how do we know what was here before? You know, the earth has been evolving for, well, depending on who you talk to, either 6,000 years or millions and millions of <laughs> years. So how do we know what is, is, not, an, is not an invasive species? Because we can't look back that far, can we? It's uh, kind of controversial, depending on who you talk to. Some people take the point of view that nothing's invasive because everything is native to this planet and stuff has always moved around from A to B. Mm -hmm. That's true. But what sets these invasive species, which are typically non-native to a certain area, apart from what has happened historically, is that you now have things, say, moving from, I don't know, say, Africa, for example, to California. Mm -hmm. That's not a natural migration. That's not natural range expansion. That's being facilitated by humans. And then the rate of the, the movement that we're seeing and the numbers of species being spread greatly exceeds anything that's happened historically. So something new shows up and you notice that for the first time, you know, you raise the problem, raise the question that has it always been here and we never noticed it? Or is it something new that's shown up which has come from somewhere else? And there's several ways to get to the bottom of those questions and they're pretty deep questions. So taxonomy can help us. So sometimes we find something new and there is just no taxonomic relatedness to anything else in this area, which strongly suggests it probably didn't evolve here and it came from somewhere else. And then you can take that one step further is that you can extract the DNA from those populations that you're interested in, analyze it, and then backtrack through the areas where you think it may have come from until you basically get a, a match with that DNA fingerprint. And we've done that a lot to source the area of origin for the invasive pests that we are dealing with. So it's sort of like a CSI project where, you're, where you have your invasive population that's come in. It's small, often it's genetically homogenous, not a lot of variation there because these founding populations are quite small. You extract the DNA with uh, help of taxonomists, you know, you may know that this general group of bugs, for example, maybe it comes from some part of India, some part of Southeast Asia, that's where there's a lot of biodiversity for this group. And um, I've done this a lot. You go back into those areas, you spend months collecting throughout the native range, you bring back those specimens, extract their DNA, and then you begin matching it up. And sometimes you get an almost exact hit. And you can say with a very high level of certainty that this population that we've found in California 
came from Indonesia. We've done this with invasive weevils. But Indonesia is made up of hundreds of islands. We've actually managed to pinpoint the island that that insect population came from because a lot of these islands are separated. There's not a lot of gene flow between them. So the islands have distinct genetic fingerprints. So we can say that this weevil that we didn't see in California before showed up in 2010. Nobody thinks it should be here. There's no native species that are closely related to it. A lot of biodiversity in Southeast Asia. You head back there, you make the collections, do the DNA, have some taxonomists look at the material. Everybody agrees that it's the same thing. The DNA confirms it. And you've got pretty good evidence that this is a non-native species that's now made its home in California. How devastating has the, the pet trade been for just the world? You know, and, and, and secondarily to that, ships just traveling between all these different ports and filling ballast and dropping ballast and filling ballast. Like how devastating has that been for the environment? Yeah, so um, that, that, that's, uh, there's two big questions in there that we need to address. So we'll start with the pet trade first and then we'll come to oceanic travel and ballast movement. So the pet trade, there's a lot of evidence that the pet trade has been extremely detrimental. In the US, for the most part, it's largely an unregulated industry. You know, People can import snakes, birds, different types of mammals breed them up, sell them. There's no restrictions on movement in a lot of cases, unless state law prevents you from importing a certain species, but there are many workarounds with that. You can just drive it in yourself, maybe have somebody ship it through the internet or FedEx or something and, and you'll get it. So some very good examples of the pet trade contributing to some you know, pretty catastrophic environmental problems is one that's received a lot of publicity lately, and those are the uh, python infestations of the Florida Everglades and the subsequent loss of mammal and bird diversity and reptile diversity in the Everglades as those pythons have you know, basically bred up over many years into very large populations. Those animals have no sort of evolutionary history with a stealthy predator that sneaks up on you, strangles you, and then swallows you. I think I was just reading recently that it's expanded its range now out of Florida. I think it's found in the southern parts of Georgia now. So it may end up filling in a lot of the southeastern United States where temperatures are permissible and habitat is, is suitable. So there's really no uh, limit on where it could go based on that environmental boundaries. It's probably going to fill in all of that eventually, you know, okay. given that the temperatures are right and the habitat is suitable and there's food for it. So to get to ballast water, yes, that's been a major contributor of uh, movement of non-native species from one part of the world to another. So the uh, St. Lawrence Seaway and the Great Lakes of the United States are heavily infested with non-native species that have been moved from one part of the world to the other in ballast water. That ballast water is discharged in those super tankers and basically it's an aquarium. It's all sort of full of microscopic organisms, plankton, small fish, you know, tenophores, crustaceans, those have established in the Great Lakes and some of those have escaped, got into the Mississippi um, drainage basin, you know, zebra and quagga mussels are a great example of that. The fishhook water flea, which was a big problem in the Great Lakes for a while. Um, a lot of the stuff moved out of Central Europe in, in ballast water. And even the Port of San Francisco, you know, sea environments aren't immune. I was reading something fairly recently that the uh, San Francisco Bay is thought to be one of the most heavily invaded seawater areas in the world because so many ships have come in there and dumped so much ballast water that all sorts of animals, algae, seaweeds, uh, have basically established in areas where they didn't exist before. So the, the eastern forests of the United States have been heavily impacted by an invasive beetle, mm -hmm. you know, so how do you, how would we, you know, or, or, you know, feral pigs or the pythons yeah. like, or kudzu or well, any of these, yeah. any of the, these things, you know, and lots, I'm sure you could think of a million others. How do you, you know, we, we saw that in Australia with the toads, you know, toads were mm -hmm. brought in to stop something yeah. and then just went out of control. And I don't know that you can ever get the genie back in the bottle. Can you, or how do right. you think? So with the cane toads that were, it's again, there's a lot of here. So feral pigs, yes, a big problem in parts of the Eastern United States, a growing problem in the Central Valley of um, California. 
very destructive towards uh, a lot of our agricultural crops. They change the environment through making pig wallows. Uh, they have, you know, have a lot of diseases associated with them. A lot of these pigs are now considered super pigs because the original feral stock that was imported from Europe is now bred with um, escaped, genetically altered, uh, domesticated pigs, you know, they've been bred for year round litters, huge litter size. So you cross those with the wild boars, which have this fur and very aggressive behavior. They can survive winter, they're omnivorous, they can eat all sorts of stuff. So you've ended up melding. It's like Jurassic these, Park or something. Yeah, these, like these a horror movie. trays from, you know, wild pigs that allow them to survive with these fast development, high reproductive capacity in domestic pigs that we have you know, deliberately bred for because this is the type of stuff that we want in our livestock. And you fuse those two things together and you end up with basically these super feral pigs that are doing a lot of damage. So the forests in the Northeast, yes, you know, there's emerald ash borer, there's been lo Asian longhorn borer, there's a woolly hemlock adelgid, uh, gypsy moth, brown-tailed moth, a lot of these are not native. They've come from Europe or parts of Asia and they've had a you know, extremely devastating impact on, on those forests. So why, why is all this happening? How is it happening? Well, almost all of it is human mediated. And it's because humans have become very good at efficiently and rapidly moving large um, shipments of goods from one part of the planet to the other. We have a fascination for live animals, which gets us back to the pet trade. We love our plants. So we move a lot of live plants around. Those plants bring in with them their sap-sucking pests and beetles and pathogens associated with the roots or the soil that those things are planted. And because we love our plants so much, you know, we get them, we take them home, we plant them in the garden, we do everything we can to keep that plant alive. Well, by doing that, all the hitchhikers that are on it are benefiting from that love and care we're providing that plant. So not only you're growing your plant, you've created a nursery <laughs> for all the unwanted things that might be hitchhiking on yeah. that plant. So yeah, and tourism is another big thing. You know, people come into California, for example, they smuggle in fruit and other stuff. You fill out your customs form, you come in that blue and white form. No, I've got no fruit, I've got no meats, I've got no cheese. Of course I do. Everybody's stuffed it in their suitcases and mm -hmm. They get home and they've got a few mangoes or maybe some guavas or something that are infested with fruit flies. They cut them open, they're all rotten and full of maggots. So they just toss them outside in the compost heap and bang, you've got a fruit fly infestation to deal with. I have a question for you. Please. I think if we think about, first of all, this is all fascinating and really terrifying. I mean, it really is scary. And you think about COVID-19 and the kind of the origins, was it the bat or whatever, you know, what was mm -hmm. going on in Wuhan? Is, is, there, is there, do you think about that? Do you study that as well? You know, that kind of translation from now we're, we're talking about animals eating animals, but now we're thinking about now we're all paying attention to animals, you know, jumping to human beings for the virus right. somehow. Any thoughts around yeah. that? Yeah, well, this is a great example of basically um, what happens when populations that are growing too large come into contact with novel diseases and this is well documented in biology and it's an important part of population regulation density dependent mortality and diseases or disease causing organisms like viruses are very opportunistic and they're always probing to look for new hosts and this um, COVID-19 virus has obviously managed to jump from probably a mammalian host whether it's a bat or a pangolin or whatever they think it's come from and it's found an acceptable host and part of that is because humans are now pushing into areas and eating and dealing with things that traditionally when our populations were much smaller we probably wouldn't have been exposed to in such large numbers so eventually there's going to be a confluence of favorable factors the correct timing correct temperature correct environmental conditions humans in the susceptible stage the right organism pathogen everything aligns and then you end up with a novel disease like we're dealing with, with now. You know, um, the, the, the social uh, response to COVID has been atrocious. Forget about anybody's political uh, persuasion. You know, just, you, we don't cooperate with Canada. We don't cooperate with Mexico. In Europe, you see similar problems. Um, you know, 
if you had a magic wand, what would you do to negate some of these issues? What would you do with the Python issue? You know, how would we constructive, you know, they do contests to shoot a few Pythons here or there. Mm -hmm. That's not going to, that's not going to, um, that's not going to do much. I mean, do we as a species have the wisdom to understand how to, I mean, feral hogs, it seems like you can fly a helicopter around and shoot them, but it's like the snakes, you can't really find them. So you'd right. have to introduce, uh, you have to introduce something like we did that toad. Like, do we have the, do we have the wisdom as a species to understand how to, to, to uh, live in concert with our environment? Right. So um, some pest problems appear intractable as far as their management goes. And the python is a great example of that. It's very secretive. It's hard to find in those Everglades. Sorry. And it just may be that it's something that we just can't easily manage. There are other pest problems that are manageable and we can do something about them. And this gets down to a philosophical point. You know, there's this idea that, you know, if um, you, by you, I mean humans collectively, have been responsible for causing some sort of harm, then maybe we should do the right thing to see if we can fix that problem that we have caused. So one way of looking at this is through the lens of pest management, especially in agriculture, is that humans have inadvertently introduced pest species which attack our, say, our crop plants that we need to feed. And we may or may not feel a sense of responsibility to try and do something about that in a sensible and sustainable way. So one approach has been just to go out and spray all your plants with insecticides and kill everything that's out there. Not very sustainable, you end up with resistance development by these insect pests, you end up with residues on your food that you end up eating, which may or may not cause you some sort of long-term health problems. And you kill a lot of non-target species, the beneficial things you want in your orchards. So is there another way of dealing with some of these problems? And one thing that I do here at the University of California, Riverside, is we have a science, a subdiscipline within entomology, which is referred to as biological control. And Populations, as we mentioned earlier, are regulated in some way, whether it's by a disease or in the case of insects that I work with, I don't deal with diseases, but I look for natural enemies that may be parasites or predators of those pests. And often we end up with pest problems in California because that invading population has escaped regulation by those natural enemies. And part of my job is to go back to the area where those pests came from, and we touched on that earlier by doing the DNA testing using phylogeny and taxonomy to track down the home range. You go into those areas, and if it's the right type of pest, you might find a natural enemy that's very specific to it. Bring it back to quarantine. We have a very good quarantine facility here on campus. We run the safety testing, demonstrate it's going to be safe in the environment, likely to have some impact on those pest populations, and Federal government will review those data and decide whether or not you should be allowed to release and establish that natural enemy for control of that pest population. And what is what is the definition of a pest? So in my my definition of a pest is something that causes us economic or environmental harm. And if you wanted to extend that outside of agriculture, it could be a health related issue too. So for example, mosquitoes, they really don't have any agricultural um, impact but they're considered invasive pests because they may harm animals or humans because when they take a blood meal, they may uh, infect you with a pathogen that causes a disease. What were your thoughts about releasing those millions and millions of sterile mosquitoes into the environment? I think it was in Florida. Was that right. a, is yeah. that a positive uh, development or is, is this something that perhaps could have unintended consequences? Yes, there's been a lot of debate about that. The project in Florida was to um, release a lot of genetically modified mosquitoes to drive down the densities of the same species that was naturally occurring in Florida that was a hazard to humans, either through biting or disease spread. And the way you can create these genetically modified mosquitoes is through a process called genetic engineering or gene editing now. And there are several ways, a couple of ways of doing that. So traditionally, uh, genetic engineering involves, say, taking a mosquito egg, micro-injecting a foreign piece of DNA into that egg, and that would be sort of taken up into the mosquito's DNA as it developed and 
insert itself in some random place in the DNA, and then you have that particular character that you were looking for in that insect. CRISPR has changed that to some degree because now you can create these little segments of um, enzymes that go in and snip the DNA in very specific places, cut it, and then put in the exact gene sequence that you want into very specific areas. So CRISPR has sort of advanced the sophistication of modifying the genomes of these organisms as opposed to just the straight out microinjection technique. But it, it does have a, some limitations in terms of how much you can, how many you can do. Well, I think the thing is with CRISPR is that once you have managed to insert that DNA, and especially if it becomes something that's inheritable and can be passed on to your offspring, you probably don't have to create too many of those individuals because once you have male, females, or however the breeding system of the particular target is you know, able to produce offspring, ideally what you want to see is that characteristic that you've just edited into that organism to be stable and then transferable onto subsequent generations. And it's just a matter of mass rearing them into the millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, and then putting them out to the environment. Now, do you, uh, do you worry about some of the ethical, moral uh, decisions about yeah. you know, synthetic biology in, in some sense, like you can change it, not know what will happen with unintended consequences? Yeah, so I guess that really depends on what the target organism is. Um, you know, CRISPR potentially has great potential for alleviating human health issues. But do you really want to be using a technology like that is a, like a eugenics program. <laughs> if you want yeah. to look, look forward into some sort of dystopian sky fi future yeah. where you're creating like what you consider to be the perfect right. humans and discarding everybody else that's not displaying yeah. those particular physical traits that you're interested in. You know, um, uh, so you're going to go back to New Zealand. Um, you know, I've been to New Zealand many times. You know, it's a pristine. Um, you, you know, environment, especially compared to here, like maybe you as a native, you may have some feelings about it not being so pristine, but from a, um, a sustainability point of view, you know, what should we be thinking about? Because for the last few hundred years, you know, from, you know, say the industrial revolution in England, we've been sort of destroying the environment as fast as we can. We come to a place where um, we, uh, we, we, that doesn't seem like we can sustain that anymore. So how do you think about New Zealand in terms of going back there and just making, you know, like, should we be thinking to keep what biodiversity we have? Because I'm not sure we can think about going back to the Everglades when the python wasn't there, right? Like we'd have to kill them all. And I don't know that we, that's even feasible. So how do you think about sustainability when you're thinking about these kinds of things? Right. So yeah, I think uh, this idea that you can, rehabilitate damaged ecosystems back to their pristine condition is an interesting one. It's highly debated because the immediate question is, well, what was pristine? Was it before any human set foot in there? Was it before there was any fire or volcanic or natural disaster that may have ripped through that area, you know, 500,000 years ago? So those are questions that become very philosophical and in my opinion, they become very tautological. And I think in the end, what humans now are looking at is what is something we find aesthetically appealing and that we think is sustainable and sort of fulfilling a lot of desirable ecosystem functions that we expect that particular environment or habitat to, to, to fulfill. So that now becomes a very uh, human-focused mandate and essentially we collectively humans are in control of that whole process. So we will never get back to environments that were pristine. What we have to think about now is what's going to be acceptable for not only our use, but the organisms and animals and trees and other life that are in those areas that we want to protect and how are we going to sort of preserve it for the long, long term. Would and that's you, a, yeah. Please, would, uh, Please continue, Mark. I cut you off. Yeah, so that, that becomes, uh, you know, a, an area of conservation biology and a lot of sociology as well, you know, so those are very multidisciplinary uh, would you, approaches. Would you bring back extinct species? Would you bring back the carrier pigeon or the, and which carrier pigeon would it be? When was it? And 
when was it good? You know, like, would, would you think about things like that? Like, oh, I think about like that. that all the time. It's cool. Isn't it cool to think? Well, who wouldn't want to think about that? Uh, I mean, would, it would you be do it? awesome? Yeah. Well, if I had the power to do it, I, yes, you know, I, you know, I, I, maybe you've read the song of the dodo you know, by Mark Wayman. It's a brilliant book. And he makes the point that nobody even knew what a dodo sounded like. Yeah. Wouldn't it be awesome to be able to recreate that and actually see it, listen to it, watch it do its thing. I'm from New Zealand, you know, moa are extinct down there. Massive bipedal flightless birds. It'd be amazing to see those walking around. What was their behavior like? So yes, you know, and, this Pleistocene, uh, Pleistocene, you know, rewilding, you know, putting mammoth and other large mammals back into the environment where they once were. It's a fascinating idea. But now you need to take a step back and look at that because the environment and the climate and everything else is nothing like what those organisms evolved in right up to the point that they went extinct. So is there anywhere in the world you could put them now? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe you'd have to create, you know, the, the Jurassic Park type thing to, to put them in if you really wanted to keep them alive. Do you is there any, look is there at... any past that uh, you think is going to be the downfall of humankind? Yeah, so there's a couple of ways to look at that. You know, we're dealing with one now, right? A pathogen that can kill humans. It's easily transmissible, appears to be highly mutable, and seems to be able to undergo second waves and resurgences and all that sort of thing. That's one thing that's obviously of concern is that humans will die from something like that or have their population severely reduced because of something like that. And we've seen that previously, right? Bubonic plagues are a great example of that. But there are other things too, and that is our food supply and whether or not that's going to be sustainable for the long term. And a lot of our plants and animals that we grow are genetically homogenous and they've lost a lot of genetic diversity, they would need to be resilient in the face of emerging new pathogens. So we could face dual threats, you know, something that affects human health and affects the health of our food industries. So you could be facing um, disease and starvation. What lessons do you think we can take from uh, Pripyat after the nuclear explosion and the reemergence of the forest and all the animals there in Russia? I don't know what that is. <laughs> that, uh, that's, all the all the animals came right, back. And, don't feel and, bad. He asks a lot of people. Oh, you mean in Chernobyl? Yeah, Chernobyl. Oh, what did you call it? Of, well, it's Pripyat. That's the name of the town. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Just I'm not crazy. Just, no, I'm not saying you're crazy. See, I have a colleague who's been going there every other year for the last, I don't know, five or six years, maybe longer now, studying the regrowth of those forests and in a lot of ways they seem to have done quite well but there's also some weird stuff that's gone on there because of i guess the radiation and stuff that's still around so you know there's been books written about that too you know what would the planet look like if humans disappeared overnight the crumbling of the cities your wildlife coming back in taking over the streets trees growing up through the roads and all that sort of stuff so yeah there is probably going to be a a future once humans have gone, it's going to probably be quite a nice one for the planet. <laughs> yeah. well, Mark, thank you. So thank you much. so much. This was great. Oh, we're done. That yeah. was fast. Yeah. Boy, that went quickly. Well, right? you, well we're going to have you fantastic. come back. Yeah. Let's get to New Zealand, maybe. You come back and throw, throw a, your phone out the window and take us on a little hike. Yeah, that oh, was yeah. Fantastic, so, Mark. yeah, yeah. So, d while I'm down there, I'm going to be working on an invasive weed that I did my master's degree on. Mm. So, I did, I hate to see this, you can probably see all the gray in the beard, no hair anymore, yeah. but I, I didn't look like this when I did my master's 30 years ago. Yeah. I was a much thinner, leaner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, this weed, gorse, you know, was the subject of a biological control program. And in yeah. the intervening 30 years, nobody's really worked on it. So, I'm just curious to see what affects ah. climate has had on those parameters that I measured 30 years ago. So I want to take a snapshot of that now, Yeah. 30 years later. And then when I retire in about 15, 16 years, something like that, yeah. the last year that I'm here, I will take another snapshot. And then maybe yeah. we'll have three points on a line to see where things are going over time with respect to that weed and the natural enemies that feed on it. Will you come back when, you're, uh, when you get down there and you've been there a few weeks, come back and tell us what you find? So yeah, we'll see. Yeah, it would be great to come back. There's lots and lots to talk about.
Absolutely. Thank you very much, Mark. Very all right. Appreciate Thank it. you. And you all right. Okay. Bye yeah. bye. He was great. Yeah. He was great. We didn't really solve the squirrel problem, although I guess I'm not going to shoot one, but uh, he was really great. And there's so much to think about. And it's absolutely terrifying. Every single thing that he said puts. Yeah, there's so many yeah. great ideas in that. So I mean, it's honestly, cool. this is like, I mean, there's so many great ideas there that I think it would be really wonderful for him to come back when he gets down there and take us outside. We might think about him just, we could talk to him and walk around and show us those weeds. But I the agree. pythons, I just, I just want you to think about the pythons just for a little bit. I've already thought about the pythons. Not Monty Python, not that one. The other, the real python. Ciao.